continuing with the study that we were in this morning as to the false doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy or once saved, always saved. Let me remind you that we're not saying that a person must fall from grace, but we're combating the doctrine that says that a child of God can never fall from grace no matter what they believe or practice. That the Bible simply does not teach. We tried to explain also just how the favor of God, once you're in it, the grace of God, allows uh, you to enjoy the blessings of the blood of Christ to continue to cleanse you from your sin, 1 John 1, 7. And if you follow after verse 7 of 1 John 1, you'll see that he talks about if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's not just the specific confession of a particular sin or sins, although it covers that. It's the reality in our lives that as long as we're human beings on this earth, we're frail and we can sin and we're aware of that. Why, if, we, if that's not the case, do we in our prayers uh, most of the time say, please forgive us of our sins? We're aware of the fact that we're as human beings, we make mistakes. That doesn't mean you intended to, or you don't care about God's will, or you think no matter how you live and how far from God's will you are, that God's favor will continue with you. It is simply to say that you realize you're not flawless in the sense there's no room for growth and development. I think that we ought to realize that living the Christian life, being faithful to the Lord in His spiritual body, the church, is a constant effort to move forward. Now, you might ask yourself the question, which direction am I going? Well, the faith of the child of God is heading in the direction of heaven. How does he know that? He studies his Bible. He practices it. He corrects his life regularly. He's engaged in prayer. He worships God. He's ready unto every good work as the Bible defines that good work. That's exactly what is meant by 1 Corinthians 15, 58. But now you can stop those things. You can cease to do what God says Christians ought to do. You can stop praying. You can stop giving as you've been prospered. You can stop Bible study. You can stop being concerned about sick. You know, pure and undefiled religion is to visit the widows and orphans in their afflictions, to provide for them what due to their condition they don't have provide for them. You can, you can cease to be concerned about that. You can cease to be concerned about being keeping oneself from spotted from the world. But now the faithful child of God, continuing in the grace of God and having the blood of Christ continually cleanse him from sin, is the one who is sharply aware, keenly aware of the need to pursue those areas and labors continually to do so. That's what Paul meant when he said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain. Where? In the Lord. And you're baptized into Christ as the only doorway into Christ. Galatians 3, 26, 27. And all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Now that makes it interesting as we continue with this. Because if you read Revelation 3, 16. This is part of the letter the Lord wrote in the seven churches of Asia to the church in Laodicea. And he said, because thou art neither hot nor cold, in other words, you're lukewarm, you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Revelation 3.16. Now notice, spewed out of Christ. So we can get out of Christ. And Christ says, if you do not live as the Bible says Christians are to live, then the house I'm going to deal with you. Paul said that men would uh, apostatize, or as we say, fall away from the faith of doing the very things we've just been mentioning a moment ago in 1 Timothy uh, 4, verses 1 through 3. Now, mind you, that's, Timothy needs to know this for himself. But as a preacher, he needs to preach this to the churches. So it's evident, I think, that they had the faith or they were departed from it. Now, you can't be both. You're either in the faith, you're either faithful, or you have left the faith. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 2, he says, having condemnation. 
because they have cast off their first love. King James Version. Uh, the American Standard reads having condemnation because they've rejected their first pledge. In other words, think of when you obeyed the gospel. You were pledging your life to Christ. What does that mean? The rest of your life you're going to live like he says. Then too, we see that a Christian's harvest will be or is dependent upon what we sow. And we have to understand how one does so as a Christian. But we find this said to the Galatians in which he also said in the chapter before, whosoever you are that are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace, Galatians 5, 4. Then in Galatians 6, 7 through 9, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. How do you sow to the Spirit? Whoever sows to the Spirit, as that term's used here, is going to reap what? Life everlasting. Well, I certainly want to be that man. But what is it to sow to the Spirit? It is to abide in the doctrine of Christ. It is to live as the New Testament teaches us to live. It is, as is said, and we quote most often, James 1.25, Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he, being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And that's just all there is to it. I get the idea, if you allow me to go off on a tangent for a moment, or even if you won't allow me to, I am anyway. Uh, so here is, here is exactly what I find from people. When they talk about, have you ever watched them? Even in the church. Such a spiritual person is brother so-and-so. Sister so-and-so is a spiritual person. If you were to ask most of them, say, what are you talking about? What makes you say that about that person? What is there in that person's life, in that person's conduct, in that person's actions that says you, uh, that she or he is such a spiritual person? I promise you some people cannot tell you why unless it's some sort of smile or something like that. And here's why. They think of spiritual as some sort of mysterious, ethereal thing that really is not physical or fleshly. All being spiritual is is being faithful to your Lord and doing what the Lord told you to do in the way He told you to do it for the reason He told you to do it. That's being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's just a definition of spiritual. So a spiritual person is one that is led and guided and directed by the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. No mysterious thing about it. It's just another way of saying the same thing as being faithful. So to be faithful is to be obedient. To be obedient is to be spiritual. If you're not spiritual, you're not obedient. Thus, you're not faithful. That's all there is to it. So a spiritual person doesn't look physically any different than a non-spiritual person. Because you can't tell just by looking at how we look today whether during the week we're obedient to God or not. So that makes a difference. So this message, Galatians 6, 7 through 9, was addressed to members of the Lord's church, to Christians. Therefore, the universal law of sowing and reaping applies to the Christian as well as to the alien sinner, the one that's never obeyed the gospel. So what, what does it mean to sow to the flesh? Well, John helps us on this. We've all read 1 John where he talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And he says, that's the world I'm talking about that you as a Christian, and he wrote that to Christians, are not to love. Because that's all passing away. All that's going to leave. We put too much emphasis, we spend too much time on things that are all going to pass away. I think one of the greatest commentaries, and you've heard me say this several times in sermons and lessons, that I've ever heard in such plain, simple language was when the account is given of Marshall Keeble being taken up an airplane by a Christian brother who had a large ranch in West Texas, and he cheered him over it. He got out and said, well, Brother Keeble, what do you think about all this? Brother Keeble's comment was, the Lord's going to burn it all up. Well, how much time do we spend with everything that's going to cease to be? Even all the time we spend on our physical bodies, it's going to all disappear. So how do you sow to the Spirit? I'm going to tell you again. 
Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. How do you know what the work of the Lord is? Continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. That's exactly what the work of the Lord is. To learn how to enjoy pure and undefiled religion. And that is to do the Lord's bidding according to what it is to be faithful, which means you're spiritual in the Lord. Of course, believers can sin and be in danger of eternal damnation. Notice how James addressed Christians in James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Uh, my brethren, then he says, if any among you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he that converteth a sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall cover or hide a multitude of sins. Well, that places an obligation on the faithful, doesn't it? In this case, an obligation on the faithful concerning who? Our brethren who have sinned. Again, I stand amazed, and I always have been over the years as a preacher, it seems that some people think that if you practice a few sins and you don't repent of them, that's no big deal. You just about have to deny the existence of God, the deity of Christ, the inspiration of the Bible, for your canon is one that is caught up in sin. I never read that in my Bible. Nobody else has either because it's not there. I mentioned Galatians 6, 1 and 2, and now this passage by James. And each talks about a sin. One sin. Of course, you can include more. But one sin is enough to separate you from God. Each sin we have must be covered by the blood of Christ. And we've already discussed how that happens. 1 John 1, 7, and what it is to be headed toward heaven according to the will of God, though you may make mistakes from time to time. You know, even a wicked man like Hitler can do some good things. He built the Autobahn system of Germany way ahead of the United States. Somebody might say, well, he did a pretty good thing. He built the Volkswagen. Well, that's according to whether you like cars or not, but the people's wagon he built. But does that, you think, doing those couple of good things, if you want to call them good, made any difference to all the rest? Well, certainly not. The point being, you can be a very wicked person and do some good things. But turn it around. You can be a very devout person, very faithful, but because you're a human being, you will do from time to time, or you may omit from time to time things you ought to do as a child of God. What well, does that mean, that you're not uh, at all what you ought to be? No, it means if you're faithful, you're taking care of those matters. And if your brethren are faithful and you don't notice it, then they're concerned for you. They don't wait till you've jumped completely out of the pasture and run off out in the desert and say, well, I guess we'll do something about this. You get a little bit concerned when they keep pushing against the fence. We don't think that way. Yet that's so simple. Yet so powerful a lesson. So these were believers, James 2, 1. And notice they were in danger of, of falling away. We can sin against the brethren. And when we sin against our own brethren, of course all sin ultimately is against God, the transgression of His law. Some of those laws pertain about how we treat our brethren. And thus when we sin against the brethren and cause them to go into sin themselves, then that means that we have jumped over the fence as far as the boundaries of truth. Listen to what's said in 1 Corinthians 8, 11. For through thy knowledge he that is weak perisheth, the brother for whose sake Christ died. Well, here's a brother who doesn't have the knowledge of the Bible that you do and sees you doing something that may be perfectly right, but he doesn't understand, and he goes out and does something that is definitely wrong. What does that say? It means I must be cautious. It means I must be careful as to the pattern of life, my example, that I set before everybody. And when you look at a congregation, great or small in number, there are always people who have lack of knowledge, uh, young people in particular, Look up to older ones, if they're what they ought to be, for examples to follow. I imagine that most parents, though as godly as they can be, don't realize sometimes the impact they have on their children just by the way they look at other folks and talk about them or whatever they say. Their kids begin to build those same biases or prejudices, or if they're good points, that they have. Be that as it may, our example, our power of our action 
it's for good or for bad, the influence that we have. So we do not want to cause people to do that. So you see the vigilance that must be in, in our lives. And none of us are flawless in this. But we won't get any better if we don't remind ourselves of it and exhort ourselves to be concerned about it. Many of our Lord's disciples turned from him while in his earthly ministry. In John 6:66, 6, upon this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. That's because that they didn't understand what he meant by offering his blood, eating his body and drinking his blood. They had no idea about that, and that offended them. They didn't take the time to understand, to ask those questions. And sometimes you can't help that. You do things, and people get upset, and they form their own views of it, and they won't let you explain anything to them or teach them any better. But it happens. So it's admitted that man cannot be saved apart from Christ, John 15 and verse 5. And many of Christ's disciples forever separated themselves from him, John 6, 66. Now what does that say? Therefore the disciples of Christ were eternally lost. As it leaves them in the scriptures. I don't know whether any of them later may have turned back. Who knows? You just don't know. But at that time, they walked away and it does not indicate they returned. A child of God can be lost because he can lie. And he can die being a liar, unforgiven, in that he told a lie intending to deceive. So people want to say, well, rest in peace. <laughs> I said something about that earlier. The only people that will rest in peace, if they even understand what rest and peace is when they say that about the dead, are the people who die faithful to the Lord. So the fate of those who die in the condition of being a liar is plainly taught in Revelation 21.8. And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So that's serious business. When you tell a lie, you're reserving your place eternally in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is second death. Second death being the eternal death. It's either possible for a child of God to be lost, or it's impossible for a child of God to ever taste death under certain conditions. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 10, Paul tells us that no drunkard shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now question, can a child of God get drunk? Well, that's a silly question, isn't it? Of course a child of God can get drunk, and you even have some places teaching that it's all right to take as beverages intoxicating substances, which I don't understand that because if you can uh, drink beverage alcohol, why can't you smoke marijuana or take anything else that alters the mind? <clears throat> Well, if you say yes to the fact that a man can get drunk, that is, a, ch a child of God, but men say that God will not let him die in that condition, and Baptist debaters have said that over and over again when they had enough conviction to debate this doctrine. So if that were true, a Christian could get drunk and stay drunk and never would die. And when they've had that pointed out to them, they observed the Passover on that and went on down the road. That's just an absurdity is all that is. If a child of God cannot be lost, then the devil is a fool. Now think about that for a minute. If a child of God, a member of the church, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, cannot be lost, then why is the devil trying to get us to do whatever it is that he wants us to do that's contrary to the will of heaven? He's been laboring all these thousands of years to cause the souls of the children of God to be damned. Think about it for a minute. Who were Adam and Eve? Children of God. Seems to me they came lost. But see, if this doctrine is true, how would he have ever gotten them to be lost? But they sinned, didn't they? And when they sinned, they were separated from God. But according to the doctrine, a child of God, now they're going to have to say Adam and Eve were child, children of God. But they were. Adam and Eve were children of God. But they sinned. And they were lost. And in order to get them, all mankind, saved, then a whole system of salvation took thousands of years to bring it about until the fullness of time God sent forth His Son. And He did what Christ only could do to save us. So if you're going to take a position, a child of God cannot so sin as to be eternally lost, 
then have they ever read about what Satan did to Adam and Eve, who were children of God? Now let's look at some so-called proof texts. John 5, verse 24, often is used to say that a child of God cannot so sin as to be eternally lost, that you cannot, once saved, fall from grace. Verily, verily, Christ said, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth him that sent me hath eternal life, and cometh not into judgment, but hath passed out of death into life. Now, mind you, this is one of those passages that's wrested from its context and is attempted, uh, they attempt to use to say that the believer has eternal life now, and hence it's impossible for the believer to be lost. Well, we know that one scripture does not contradict another scripture. So we know there needs to be a proper explanation to harmonize these scriptures. Our Lord's statement concerning his shed blood will help us. He said plainly in instituting the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, verse 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Now notice how that Christ spoke as if his blood had actually been shed. But it was still flowing in his veins, wasn't it, when he said this, wasn't it? It was to be shed or poured out in the future. Apparently, in John 5, verse 24, Jesus carried himself forward to the very final judgment and spoke as if it were present. The believers enjoy the promise of eternal life and receive it or carrying himself forward to that same judgment, the believer hath eternal life. Well, if anybody does hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord, it's going to be the person who is faithful all his life, whether it's brief or long. The believer has eternal life in two senses. First of all, he has it promised. Nobody else has that promise to them, First John chapter 2, verse 25. And number two, and he has Jesus, who is the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. So John wrote, First John 1, in verse 2, by the way, he wrote it to Christians. However, the Bible teaches in many places that the believer upon this earth does not now have eternal life in its actuality. Let me give you for instance. Both eternal life and everlasting condemnation are on the other side of physical death. Daniel 12 verse 2. We are at present as faithful members of the church in hope that's expectation of what faithful children of God have a right to receive and we have an earnest desire to receive it. We have that hope of eternal life, Titus 1, 1 and 2. And we do not hope for what we do not have promised to us, Romans 8, verse 25. Now, who has the promise of eternal life from Jesus Christ? The one who is faithfully living in the Lord's church. The Lord will render eternal life, I know that, from Romans 2, verses 6 and 7. Eternal life is to come not right now, but whenever the end is. If it is in a matter of seconds, it'll come then. If it's 10 years from now, it'll come then. Romans 6, 22. The righteous, the faithful, the believers will receive eternal life at the same time that the wicked receive eternal punishment. Matthew 25, 46. So, eternal life is to be received in the world to come. Who has that promise? Those who are faithful right now. That's why in Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Of course, there's talking about if you must give up your life on earth in order to be faithful, then give it up and receive the crown of eternal life. 
Then another, <clears throat> who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Then he said, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in, mark that, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, <clears throat> 35 through 39. <clears throat> now if the passage if the passage has reference to our love of God, instead of God's love for us, it still does not teach the impossibility of apostasy. But rather that such external things cannot separate us from the love of God. <clears throat> but this is far short of teaching that we cannot separate ourselves from the love of God. It's plain that we can separate ourselves from the love of God for the student of the Bible who believes it. Notice John 15, 9. And he's speaking to the apostles here. Abide ye in my love. John 15, 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Then in Jude 21, keep yourselves in the love of God. Thus indicating that our remaining in the love of God is conditional. We must be busy about doing those things that the Lord has enjoined upon us as Christians. Now if you wish to say that the passage is reference to God's love for man, it still does not prove the impossibility of apostasy. Because the fact that God loves a man is no proof of man's salvation. For God loved the whole world, John 3.16. And he loved us while we were yet sinners, Romans 5 and verse 8. So we still have, as free moral agents, responsibilities to God to become a Christian, to get into his favor in Christ, and to remain in Christ. Then there's this statement in 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is begotten of God doeth no sin, because his seed abideth in him, and he cannot sin. Because he is begotten of God. John says that the person cannot sin because the seed abideth in him. Well, what is the seed? <clears throat> the seed is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. But I learned that the devil can steal that seed from a person's heart in Luke 8 and verse 12. John is not teaching in this verse that it's impossible for a Christian to sin because he teaches in other places just as plainly that one can. Notice, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 8. Notice another passage. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. But another one. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye may not sin. 1 John 2 and verse 1. But we note another one. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1. Now the person who places an interpretation on one passage that contradicts other plain passages has surely misinterpreted that passage. Thus, another passage is shown not to teach the impossibility of apostasy. In Romans chapter 7, all the way from verses 15, verse 15 through verse 25, there is used as an effort, or an effort is made by those who believe this doctrine to prove that it's the body of the Christian which sins and not his spirit. This has been a big one in Baptist debaters long years ago. In other words, the spirit is sanctified and saved and remains that way, but the body may do all sorts of things contrary to the will of heaven. If so, and if what a man sows he shall reap, Galatians 6, 6, and 7, 
then his body is going to be cast into hell while his spirit will go to heaven. Now, think about other passages of Scripture you know that run headlong into that. This is something somebody might say regarding the Bible's teaching is new under the sun. A man's spirit in heaven, his body in hell. When the Bible teaches that in the resurrection, there is a resurrection of damnation and there's a resurrection of eternal life. Well, resurrection means you go back in a body. The spirit of man lets sin reign in his body. Romans 6, 12, which you were warned not to do. It is the spirit instead of the body that knows, according to 1 Corinthians 2, and verse 11. And number three, some sins are committed to gratify the flesh, but they're first committed in the heart and proceed from the heart to be gratified by the flesh. Mark 7, 21 through 23. So that whole thing is discombobulated in nothing but a resting of the scriptures to make the Lord teach what he didn't teach. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is through fire. 1 Corinthians 3.15 well, the idea is the teacher's works, which may be burned, are the persons he converted. This certainly be a loss, but he himself would be saved. You teach people the truth, they believe and obey it. You're an instrument in reaching them the truth. But that doesn't guarantee they're going to remain faithful. But that's your work. But he's lost, and you're saved. That's your work that's lost. Because that work is a person. And that person is chosen to leave the truth. Or else what about all these passages that says people do leave the truth? And as Paul said of Demas, he's left me having loved this present world. The Corinthians were Paul's work and he feared that some might be lost. Thus, he would lose his work. So this verse disproves rather than proves the impossibility of apostasy. It's saying you can teach people the truth. That's your work. But if they leave the truth, you be saved because you remain faithful. But what about them? They're lost. Then we read, Who by the power of God, God guarded through faith unto a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. 1 Peter 1.5 Well, what guards us? Why, it's the power of God and salvation. That's through faith. Through our faith built upon us, saith the Lord, proposition. The exertion of the power is of God. To believe is our part. And we shall do well to remember that man can quit believing. Hebrews 3.12. In fact, the whole epistle of the Hebrews is to stop them from their actions, which actions prove they were stopping believing. So they fail to be guarded by the power of God. Is a person... Guarded by the power of God? Yes, but what's the power of God? It's the gospel. So if we walk in the light as he is in the light, what's the light? It's the gospel. Gospel light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, are we guarded or are we not? Well, of course we are. How could the Lord say to the person who dies in faith, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Matthew 7, 21 and 23 is used to prove that Christ does not know and has never known the ones who fall. It is amazing to me how people... To defend a human doctrine will embrace some of the things they do. But the passage, of course, does not prove the impossibility of apostasy. It only proves that Christ had never known these false prophets. For we learn in verse 1 of the paragraph that they are, all, that they are the ones under consideration. Known means you've been with me. You've been on my side. I've known you in that sense. But a false prophet who's never obeyed the gospel or one who's left the faith is not known by the Lord. I never knew you. Or he says in one picture of the judgment, I know ye not. You realize in those two statements, that covers the person that never obeys the gospel and it covers the person who's in the church that apostatizes. I never knew you. You never became a Christian. I know you not. I may have known you one time, but I don't know you now because you've apostatized. They went out from us, but they were not of us. Let that sink in for a minute, brethren. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they are not of us. 1 John 2, 19. Now, in verse 18, 
We learn that John is speaking of Antichrist, people opposed to Christ. There's all sorts of ways you can be opposed to Christ. You don't have to say he's not deity, and that's the only way that you're opposed to Christ. All you have to do is oppose his teaching. Listen to what's quoted most often by us in John 12, 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words, look how he equates that with rejecting him. That receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him the words that I have spoken, the same shall judgeth him in the last day. He that rejecteth me, how they do it? And receiveth not my words. To not receive the words of Christ is what? To reject Christ. Can a member of the church do that? Certainly they can. So these antichrists had gone out from the apostles preaching a different doctrine. And this was proof that they were not of the apostles. How am I going to know whether a person's faithful or not? Well, are they teaching what the New Testament teaches? Or are they teaching something different to it? If they're teaching something different to it, they've gone out from us. If they're abiding in it, they're of us. It doesn't seem to be too difficult. There is no temptation, another passage, taken you but such as this man can bear. But God's faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But will with the temptation make a way of escape that ye may be able to endure it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. With every test of our belief in God, any thing that tests our confidence in Him based on His Word, then we may be sure that there's a way of escape. Now, it may be an escape like Stephen, the first Christian martyr had, that in not compromising the truth, you escape into glory by at the hands of your killers. But the point is, there's a way of escape. And the point made here is, you have the choice. As a free moral agent, you can choose the way out. Now, what are we promised? There's a way of escape. Many times we don't look for it, I'm afraid. But it's there, or else God's a liar, and I don't believe that. Then he says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So we need to look for those things. Well, you can't find them if you don't know the Bible well enough to how to look for them. Again, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. John 10, 27 and 28. Do we not know that these promises are conditional and dependent upon the persons following Christ? Notice, they follow me. Jesus teaches in the 12th verse of the chapter that the sheep can be snatched and scattered, and the wolf snatcheth them and scattereth them. Well, you're going to adopt an interpretation of John 10, 27, 28 that throws it right in contradiction to this verse? No. The foregoing Proof texts that we've just given are not all the ones that are twisted to try to support the once saved, always saved doctrine. But they're the main ones. And the thing we need to realize is this. I am a creature of choice. I will either choose the way to heaven as presented in the New Testament, or I will reject it and choose some other way. Believe a lie and make myself believe something like the false doctrine of once saved, always saved. We don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we check ourselves and make sure that what we believe is in harmony with the will of heaven. We want to be sure that as members of the church, we are faithful in not trying to justify ourselves and think that heaven's our home while we know we are in sin. It won't work. So honesty is always important, Luke 8, 15. And without it, no matter how well you know your Bible, it's not going to do you any good. Because if you're dishonest with the truth, you're not apt to obey it. You're apt to try to steer around it and do something else. If you're a child of God, we urge you, if you've sinned, to repent of those sins. That's God's second law of pardon. Confess those sins and pray God to forgiveness. That should be with us every day of our life as we go toward heaven. It's a part of being faithful. It's a part of of walking in the light as he is in the light. So let that be a comfort to us. We're not saying, I say again, that you have to fall from grace. But for somebody to say that you cannot is a big, big difference. One's taught in the Bible, the other is not. We can be faithful, we can be humble, 
We can receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. We can correct our lives. And the Lord knows that. And the blood of Christ will continue to cleanse us from sin. 1 John 1, 7. If you need to obey the gospel, we urge you to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ that your sins may be remitted. If you need to come to the Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.